So Ben Brockmiller, uh, my uh, research scientist, is going to share those results. And then we are so thrilled to have a farmer share his experiences. And I think it's a the previous talk was really a great setup. Um, Vince Hyman is an organic farmer, organic grain farmer, just about 30 minutes outside of Madison. And he's gonna share not only how he's adapted some of the roller crimper techniques on his farm, but I think more broadly, um, adapting equipment and, and talking about how he's integrated some of the concepts that, that Matt just talked to us about. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Ben. All right, thank you, Aaron, And it's great to see all of you here today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ben Brockmiller, and I've been working with Aaron for a couple of years now and, and having a lot of fun doing it, um, particularly working with some of these no-till organic systems. And so today what we'll be talking about is how does this work? How do these no-till or reduced tillage organic systems work? So we'll be kind of going through some of the nuts and bolts of that. Um, so if you're new, you've never tried it before, hopefully this will be a, a good opportunity for you to kind of see how the system works. And we'll also be presenting on some data that we've been doing from our, our previous research as well. So if you've been doing this for many years, hopefully you'll be able to uh, take away something as well. Um, so no-till organic, I think it's helpful just to have kind of a, a discussion on, on what we mean by when, when we say that. And so when we say no-till, what we're really referring to is what we call rotationally reduced uh, tillage systems. So we're taking no-till out of a phase of the crop rotation. Um, so what Aaron and I have been working on uh, primarily is looking at that uh, corn phase of the rotation and also that soybean phase of the rotation and seeing what are the ways that we can use um, other managements. Uh, Matt Ryan talked about those mini little hammers and so for us one of those hammers is using cover crops as a, a method to suppress weeds. And so the development of these uh, no-till systems or reduced till systems in organic has really kind of uh, come from some of the challenges that we've, we've seen when we uh, do organic uh, practices with cultivation. And so again, uh, it's, it's great to follow Matt Ryan in his presentation because many things kind of build off of that. And he talked about weed management and some of the challenges that we have in weed management. And particularly, he mentioned how uh, when, when we get those wet conditions early in the season, it can uh, inhibit some of our, our mechanical methods of weed control and result in some reduced yields. And so these no-till systems allow us a method to kind of uh, bypass that by using the cover crops as a, our, our primary tool to, to manage the weeds. Um, additionally, another big advantage we see from these systems is the ability to reduce labor. Uh, Whereas in a traditional cultivation kind of system, you're going out doing a lot of stale seed bedding perhaps, or doing cultivation within the season, uh, we're able just to kind of let that rye uh, or cover crop biomass do the work for us. And then finally, kind of from a soil health perspective as well, um, going through doing a bunch of tillage, we, we see some uh, hindrance in, in our ability to build up soil. And also uh, there's concerns about erosion as well, particularly where we have soils that are on, on sloped areas or in windy conditions, uh, sometimes early in the spring, when we have all that soil bare, that's when we see a lot of winds and can re result in some erosion. And also some extreme weather too, um, when we have uh, lots of rainfall coming in a very short period of time. And so when we talk about soil health, I really love to, to show these couple pictures here. And um, in this presentation, I'm gonna have some pictures that, that make me cringe a little bit. And this is, this is one of them here on the, on the left. Uh, this is a field that we had uh, this spring at our research station where we had a two inch rainfall come in about a 45 minute period of time. And we had just tilled this, we had just planted some soybeans in there, and as you can see all of that real erosion, we lost quite a bit of soil in that system. Whereas if we compare that to the, this picture that we have on the other side that was under our, our no-till kind of uh, scenario, um, that cover crop mulch really helped keep that soil in place. And again, this is a, another picture just kind of showing similar things where we have that cover crop mulch. Um, you can just see the, the, the good aggregation there from the uh, surface and uh, some of the earthworm castings on there. And it's really a situation that we, we like to see with that uh, cover crop mulch. So within reduced tillage system, and again, I, I got this idea from uh, Dr. Ryan with this concept of the mini little hammers. And essentially what we're doing is we're using our cover crops as one of our, our little hammers in our, our toolkit. And so, um, but then I, th I think it's important to say that this is part of a, a wider systems-based approach. 
um, in developing these more reduced tillage systems over time. And within that, we have ecology that we can look at, we have different kind of equipment that we can look at, and also different kind of technology. And so we're gonna touch on some of these things and how they work together um, to build these no-till organic systems. And then again, as, as Dr. Ryan made a good point, this is a systems-based approach and we see synergies between them. So this one plus one plus one equals five refers to that. We see these different concepts building off of each other and uh, becoming more beneficial as we combine them together. So to start off, we'll talk a little bit about no-till soybeans and then move on to no-till corn as well. And um, I think it's helpful just to look at yields sometimes right away from the start. And so this is the past 12 years that we've have uh, data from the Arlington Research Station. And um, I, a few things to take away from this. So first of all, we typically see our yields go within about five bushels per acre of our cultivated soybeans. Some years it's a little bit more, some years it's a little bit less. Um, where we do see some issues is under drier conditions, uh, it can increase the risk. So 2012, for example, we had a pretty severe drought and um, didn't have good results there. And also in 2021, uh, where we had some drier conditions as well. That rye takes up a lot of soil moisture, and if we're not getting rainfall back in the, in the summer, we can uh, get ourselves into a difficult situation in terms of soil moisture for the soybeans. And then another issue too is the efficacy of weed control within the rye mulch. If we don't get that biomass necessary to really suppress the weeds, we can see a reduction in yields as well. However, when it works well, it, it looks really good. And so here's some, some really good and encouraging pictures from our research locations. So in June, you can see those soybeans just coming up, a really good cover of the mulch. Um, then by July, you can still see that, that that rye biomass is really suppressing the weeds and we don't have many weeds coming up um, in between the rows. And then in August, by the time the soybeans canopy, they're able to really suppress weeds on their own as well at this point. But because of the work that was done by the rye mulch earlier in the season, we don't see a lot of weeds coming up through the crop canopy. So the system is a really kind of a three-step process. Uh, so the first step was just the establishment of the rye, and we do this in mid-September um, to late September at, at the latest. And then from there, it's a pretty hands-off approach all the way up until soybean planting, so we don't have to go take our, our tractor out and get the tires muddy in the spring trying to do some uh, stale seed bedding before planting. Um, so then the next step is really uh, roller crimping and planting. Uh, we like to do this in a single pass operation. Had some conversations last night too with, with folks who like to uh, plant first and then come back and roller crimp. And so it's great to see some of the different innovative ideas and ways that people have made it work in their systems. And from there, it's again a pretty hands-off process all the way up until soybean harvest when we, when we harvest that in October. So I'll be talking a little bit now about each of these stages and also some of the challenges that we see associated with them. So first of all, one of the challenges that we see is we need to get quite a bit of rye biomass in order to suppress the weeds adequately. Um, so typically people talk about somewhere between 8,000 to 10,000 pounds per acre of rye. And another challenge we see is sometimes over time we can see a shift in weed communities and also um, this rye biomass mulch does a better job at suppressing certain types of weeds as opposed to other types of weeds. So we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, so when it comes to rye management and really any kind of cover crop management, it comes down to your objectives. What are you hoping to get out of that cover crop? So if you're managing your cover crop to cycle nutrients, you're going to manage it in one way. Whether you're trying to manage it to sequester carbon, you might manage it another way. And so for us, what our objective is in this is we're trying to manage rye in order to suppress weeds. And so Aaron often talks about how um, it's really important to, to think about this almost as managing an alternative cash crop as opposed to a cover crop because it's really important that we get things right on the front end to avoid problems later in the season on the back end. So for us, the way we go about this is we typically seed about 3 million seeds per acre. Um, and this comes out to about 150 pounds per acre of rye depending on, on what variety we're using. And Another conversion would be three bushels per acre is, is another way that uh, people will talk about that. And for us, planting date is, is super important as a way to get that rye established, to get it to, to tiller and put on some growth in the fall. We see that being really a good predictor of success for how much biomass and how, uh, how, how well it's going to suppress weeds later in the season. So this is just a, a fantastic picture from Stephen Mursky, a researcher out of Maryland who went into this field on April 1st um, and looked at the different planting dates that, that they'd gone and planted their rye at. 
and just looked at the differences in growth potential from those. And so for us, um, what we really want to see is we want to see good soil coverage um, early, right away early in the spring. So in our fields, this is kind of what that looks like. Um, this picture is taken on April 4th. We had a, a September 17th planting date on this. And really what we want to see is it looking like a lawn when we go out there. If we see good soil coverage at this point in the spring, um, it's pretty good indication that we'll get good weed suppression. And if, if it's, it's not like that, if it's more like this picture from October 15th, um, that's, that starts to show that there's going to be a lot of risk and we might have to make alternative plans for, for how to manage this rye. Uh, the other thing is that different varieties of rye perform differently, um, and so it's really important to find a variety. Well, first of all, it's important to get a, uh, a named variety instead of going with a, a VNS or a variety not selected, um, because we want that uniformity in characteristics. And so looking at different varieties of rye, some things that we want to consider is, first of all, the biomass potential. We want to see how much biomass will each of these varieties potentially put out there. We also want to look at lodging susceptibility. Lodging has been an issue in order to get good seed to soil contact when we plant those soybeans. And also anthesis dates. Um, typically a roost stick and ND gardener are some of these varieties that we've seen mature a little bit earlier, which just allows us to get out into that field and plant a little bit earlier as well. And so this graph here is some data from our Arlington Research Station over the past couple of years where we, we looked at a couple different varieties. And we found that a rustic and ND gardener both produced a little bit more biomass as compared to other varieties. Now, I, I like data a lot, and I, I especially like data when it tells a story. So there is a story within here that I think is important. Um, so first of all, on this, on this graph here to the left, it's not going to be surprising to anybody as we saw more wheat biomass, we saw our soybean yields decrease. That would, that would be expected. Um, this uh, graph here on the right now is showing our, our rye biomass as compared to our weed biomass. So the question is, as we increase that rye biomass, what effect is that having on our weed biomass? And so we can see when we exceed 10,000 pounds per acre of rye biomass, we get pretty good weed control. But when we don't, we see that cluster around 5,000 um, pounds per acre, our, our, our weed uh, prevalence is, is a lot higher. However, there is this one point that's, that's kind of an outlier here, and that's, that's where this is interesting, where we had over 10,000 pounds per acre, but we also saw um, really high uh, weed, weed prevalence in there as well. So the question is, what, what happened in there? And so if we zoom into this point a little bit, this is another picture that, that makes me cringe a little bit, but this is a soybean field, and hidden in all the, the quack grasses, you, you can see the soybean. And so what this goes to show is that uh, Rye is really good at suppressing certain types of weeds, particularly our, our annual broadleaf weeds, but it, it's much less effective at some of these other types of weeds, particularly perennial weeds and also grass weeds. And so we have some issues with foxtail, uh, we have some issues with crack grass, and, and uh, Canada thistles can be another one for us. And so this goes to emphasize really the importance of those mini little hammers approach, of using alternative um, types of weed management throughout our, our throughout our whole rotation really to control weeds well. And so this looks like managing our rotations well. This looks like um, potentially even using appropriate forms of tillage well as well. So looking a little bit then at our planting, uh, some of the challenges we see with that is uh, planting into really thick rye residues is are we able to get enough emergence from there? And also late planting dates can be an issue as we have to wait uh, until rye reaches anthesis in order to plant, which pushes our planting dates into June. And also incomplete rye termination, sometimes roller crimping it in order to get a consistent kill can be a challenge as well. So we talk a lot about anthesis, and I think it's important just to kind of define that and, and, and tell why it is important that we talk about anthesis with these kind of systems. So anthesis is really the flowering phase of rye. This is where you go out to the field and you start to see pollen there. And it's only at this point that we can really effectively kill rye with a roller crimper. And so it's important for us, and this, this graph here really demonstrates that well, to wait until that point of anthesis to really get effective control. So there's a few different ways we can go about terminating rye. We've looked at mowing rye versus using a couple different types of roller crimpers as well. So these are, are some of the roller crimpers we use. We've tried Don roller crimpers versus McFarlane roller crimpers. And there's advantages and disadvantages to each of these approaches. So first of all, um, one of the big advantages from using a mower is it kills that rye immediately, whereas a roller crimper, um, it may not kill it 
directly in that moment. What happens is you take that rye plant, you push it over, and you crimp the stem, and this kind of starts to cut off the flow of water and nutrients up and down the stem, um, but it doesn't necessarily do that immediately. And we can still see that rye using some soil moisture and, and uh, some potentially some nutrients as well for even up to a couple weeks after planting. And so this picture here really demonstrates that well. You see where we went through with the sickle bar mower, all of that rye is com uh, completely brown and completely dead, whereas we still see strips of green here where we went with the roller crimper. However, from a weed management perspective, we have seen the potential for higher weed management in our mowing kind of systems. And the reason for this is um, the mower spreads the residue a little bit more than it does with the roller crimper. The roller crimper does a really good job of uniformly laying things flat. Whereas with the mower, it kind of falls in different angles and different directions, and that potentially opens up some bare soil for weeds to emerge as well. Um, from a labor perspective, um, again, we can do a roller crimper and a one-pass operation, whereas if we go with a mower, we're pretty well locked into a two-pass operation there. And then also from a yield perspective, we've seen in some cases, mowers uh, can do just as well as roller crimpers, but in other cases, due to that uh, potential risk for, for seeing some more weeds, we've seen our, our yields perform better in a roller crimper system. And so here's just uh, some data that we had from a, a study at many different site years. And I've highlighted these locations where we did see that difference in yield um, from having a mower versus a roller crimper. So switching gears a little bit to planting now, one of the issues that we see with planting is really trying to get good seed to soil contact when we're planting through really thick residues. And there's a few mechanisms that, that are at play here. First of all, getting seed placement can be challenging. Um, trying to plant into no-till soils, which are a little bit harder, but also through all that thick residue, it can be asking a lot from your planter to get good um, uniform seed depth and placement. Uh, also, furrow closure can be a bit more of an issue. When we go through and till our soils, we're making a lot of loose soil aggregates. The closing wheels can do a good job at covering those furrows up. But in these no-till systems, especially when you have a lot of residue on it, it, it makes it a little bit harder on the closing wheels. And also hairpinning, especially when we're in really dense residue stands, um, the seed getting caught up on the rye stems within the furrow can prevent germination as well. So again, here's some, some graphs uh, that come from a study that we did, and what we saw was that as our rye biomass increased, our soybean emergence decreased pretty substantially. However, the interesting thing here is on the other side, we see that our soybean yield is actually increasing um, as our rye biomass is increasing. And so that goes back to this concept of as we get more rye biomass, we're doing a better job of controlling the weeds. However, at a few of these locations, these ones that are, are circled here in red, we did see a direct correlation between our soybean emergence and our soybean yield. So what it represents is, especially in these high biomass conditions, there's a potential to improve our yields um, when, we, when we find ways to improve our, our soybean emergence as well. And so ways that we've gone about improving soybean emergence in, in our uh, setting here is we've worked with a, a really fantastic collaborator, Dr. Luck um, from Ag Engineering, who's put together this planter here. Um, and we've looked at adding coulters to it, so we put a fluted coulter on there, and we've also increased our down pressure to 300 pounds and found that doing both of those things can really help um, increase our emergence. And in some cases, we're seeing up to 13% increase in emergence in, in high residue conditions. All right, so yeah, the, the next phase of this crop rotation that we're looking at seeing if we can reduce tillage is the, the corn part of the rotation. And where we've had pretty good success with soybeans, it's been a lot more challenging to get things to work in our organic no-till corn. And we're hopeful that there's, there's ways that we can make this work and, and um, saw some really great data from Dr. Ryan and his crew at Cornell where, where they have had some success with this. Um, so the, again, when we use cover crops as our, our method of weed control, the first question is, is how do we go about finding an appropriate cover crop for corn? So we want something that's fairly different, so typically corn being a grass, we want a, a kind of legume to uh, accompany that. Um, we want something that produces quite a bit of biomass, so it's suppressing the weeds. We need something that improves soil fertility so that we're getting enough nitrogen in there for our corn. Um, we also need something that we can roll our crimp per, potentially so that we can kill it. And it also needs to overwinter in the upper Midwest, so this is a, a long list of, of requirements that we need. And the ones that we've kind of settled on are uh, winter rye and hairy vetch mix and a red clover. I know in the past Aaron has played around with some other cover crops as well, some winter peas and some other different types of clovers, and we've just had difficult 
um, success getting these to overwinter consistently, and so we've, we've typically stuck with these two. So the Winter Rye and Hairy Vetch Mix is a cover crop that will roll or crimp to kill. Red Clover functions more as a, um, a living mulch where it's growing within the rows and growing alongside the corn. So again, I'll, I'll just start talking a little bit about yields here and showing some of the different yields we've had. And uh, there is still a significant yield gap. Um, so when we talk about success in these systems, it is, uh, it's, it's success for us, but um, it's still a long ways to go to potentially overcome that yield gap with what we can get with, with cultivated corn. And just to, like, we don't have a control here, but just as a comparison on our sites, I mean, it's not unusual for us to get I would say 180 bushel an acre organic corn. So just to give you kind of a comparison, like what do we typically get? Like 180. So we're seeing like a, a on the best case scenario, almost a 50% yield reduction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with our, our Ryan and Harry Vetch mix, we're, we're typically seeing somewhere around 100 bushels per acre. Um, the red clover system is a lot more variable and we'll discuss some reasons why perhaps that is here a little bit later on. Um, but some of the challenges that we see with trying to do reduced till corn systems is first of all, we have a really late planting date for that corn and especially more in our northern climates is, is the question is, are we going to get to maturity in time? And in some cases, in, in, uh, when we plant up at our Marshfield site, which is a few hours north of here, we've had issues getting that corn to mature in time. Um, fertility can be an issue as well. You can see in this picture some of the purpling on the leaves, um, getting enough uh, uh, nutrients to that, that crop and especially at the right time um, has been a real challenge. Also terminating our cover crops have been a bit of an issue especially with hairy vetch. There's uh, the, the synchronization between when that rye reaches maturity and when that hairy vetch reach maturity isn't necessarily matched up. The, the hairy vetch reaches maturity not until uh, usually the, the second half of June whereas rye is the first half of June. And so being able to uh, adequately terminate that hairy vetch can be a challenge and We've talked a little bit uh, about the potential problems for persistence then with hairy vetch in, in, in future parts of the crop rotation as well. And then also pest problems. Um, this is something we see specifically armyworm in some of these uh, no-till roller crimp systems. So armyworms, they really like the grass weeds, so they go in, they lay their eggs and um, start eating that, that rye. Once we terminate that rye and they don't have a food source, then they move on to the corn and, and can really create a lot of damage too if we have um, high pressures of these armyworms. So I'll just discuss a little bit the way that we've gone about doing these rye and hairy vetch no-till systems. Um, so typically we apply manure prior to planting just to try to get some more fertility out there uh, for our corn. And we do this early, so we want to get our hairy vetch established early so it can produce enough um, growth in the fall that it's going to overwinter more successfully. And typically the split we're, we're doing right now is, is 70 pounds of rye and 40 pounds of hairy vetch. Then the next part of this operation doesn't happen until we, we roll our crimp and plant. Um, and so we do it usually around the middle of June, um, once rye reaches anthesis, but typically a little bit later, more into the, the early milk to early dough stages, so we can let that hairy veg get to, to pod set. Um, and we, we come in, because of the late planting dates, with a, a shorter season corn hybrid. Typically we're using somewhere around an 80 day relative maturity. And we plant at a pretty high seeding rate, 38,000 seeds per acre, um, as a, a way to kind of overcome some of those germination issues as well. Then in season, about two weeks after planting, we come back and we broadcast apply a pelletized poultry manure on there to again bring a little bit more fertility to that corn. And um, uh, this, this last point actually is, is a mistake. That should be for our clover. So really, that's that's all we do for our, our in season management of the the rye and hairy veg system. Other thing, and I apologize if you're going to say this later, but it's something I think that we don't necessarily mention because it wasn't something in the experimental design necessarily. But as Ben mentioned, um, army worms have been an issue, and we've never set up an experiment that's like a, a positive and negative, I guess, in terms of treatment versus no treatment. But we typically are treating for those army worms, so we've never not treated and seeing how much damage they could do, but just so we get some results. So we're you're usually so we're spraying once with spinosad um, or in trust and once with BT. So we are treating these systems with organically approved insecticides. And so um, just a little bit about some of the results we've had, some of our, our best success with, with some of these systems. So we set up an experiment just kind of looking at um, 
emergence percentage and issues of emergence with these organic corn and how we can modify our planter uh, to, to be most successful. And so we went through, we looked at having a coulter, um, a couple different kinds of closing wheels, and also a, a lower and higher down pressure to see how that affected uh, our emergence and our yield. And we found that coulter was very important in order to um, create that strip, cut the, through the rye, and place that seed well in there. Uh, we saw a lot better emergence. And interestingly, we saw closing wheel made a, a impact, a fairly substantial impact on our, our corn yield. And the reason for this is, um, the, the spiked closing wheel you can see here, uh, we had a lot of issues with rye, or well with a hairy vetch especially, wrapping around um, those closing wheels and creating a lot of problems with our planting and I think that opened up a lot more space for weeds to come through. And so that can be an issue in some, um, some circumstances with these closing wheels is, is having that rye and hairy vetch residue wrap around there. So looking a little bit then at our red clover system, um, so we, we start this fairly similar to how we do our rye and hairy veg system, so we put out a manure application, we're again doing this early, we're in the middle of August when we're going out and planting our clover, and we do about 15 pounds per acre, um, we seed out there. Then this system is a little bit more management intensive um, because we're trying to manage a living crop here alongside our corn. We want to reduce the amount of competition that that clover is having with our corn. And so the most success we've seen is um, just prior to planting, we go through with an undercutter. Now, if, if you're not familiar with what an undercutter is, it's just a, a high residue cultivator and it functions kind of as like a, a less aggressive version of strip tillage. So it's just going right below the soil surface and it's cutting off those, uh, the roots from the, the clover and creating a narrow furrow, maybe six inches wide, that we can go and plant our corn into. Um, Again, we're doing this about the middle of June. We use short season corn, 80 day relative maturity, 38,000 seeds per acre. Um, we've also played around with, with using a flamer as well at planting to see if that has any effect of, of uh, reducing the, the competitiveness of the clover, but we really haven't seen much of a positive effect on that. Um, in season management then, we come back, we apply some fertility, uh, two tons per acre of pelletized poultry manure. And then we do some more in-season management as well to try to reduce the competitiveness of that, that clover. So we, we have a, um, an inner row roller crimper that's a, a prototype that we've been using. And that's been a fantastic tool to try to kind of smash down that uh, clover and help that corn get a bit more of a head start over the hairy vetch and get ahead of it. Um, another method we've been looking at is using a high residue cultivator to go through and uh, terminate actually the, the uh, clover in the middle of the season as well. So some of our success versus not success in this. Now I'm showing data just from, from one site here uh, from last year. reason for that is, is we had um, largely a failure this year in getting that to work and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. But some of the things that we've seen work really well is this undercutting system can really substantially improve our corn yield the system. So the best yields we've gotten, at least since I've been here with um, organic no-till corn, was when we did this undercutting into red clover. We were getting around 135 bushels per acre. Um, and then the risk with the in-season management is, is the more you do, the more risk you have of knocking out corn plants and of, of creating damage. And so um, particularly with a high residue cultivator, we saw that be an additional risk. Now I talked about some of the challenges we have in getting this to work consistently. And um, there, there's, there's a few reasons for that. And uh, basically what's, what's making the system work really well um, is if we're able to reduce that competitiveness within the row um, to help the corn get ahead of it. And so you can see in this graph here in 2021 where we used the undercutting, um, we were able to substantially reduce the amount of biomass of clover within the row, which reduced the competitiveness. Whereas in 2022, we didn't see that difference to nearly as, as big of a degree. And so there's a couple of reasons potentially for this. First of all, um, we're relying a lot on RTK, on GPS to plant because we're creating these, these thin strips and we're trying to plant directly back into these strips. So if, if alignment is not quite right, either with our, um, with our planting or coming back and doing this in-season management with the inner row roller crimpers, we can knock out a lot of plants and that, that creates certainly a risk. Um, the other potential risk is we've seen our clover terminate better with this undercutter under drier conditions. When it's really wet at planting, like this year was for example, it tends to pick up that clover, set it back down, and the clover kind of re-roots itself. And so we're not seeing actually a termination of the clover in that kind of situation. 
So um, yeah, the, just to kind of summarize this, there's, there's a lot of challenges, but um, we're excited about the potential and excited about continuing to work on this in the future. So with that, I'll, I'll just open it up to any other questions we have before we turn it over to, to Vince.